Well, here's my premise. It's a lot easier to turn this country around in fundamental ways than we think. Uh, that's documented in history, uh, but not in our minds. Because if we grow up powerless, we exaggerate those who are powerfully aware, arrayed against us. It's just like anything else. If you think you are powerless, you tend to exaggerate the powers who are making you powerless. And that is an extremely important awareness that you should convey to your friends and neighbors and co-workers. So take my remarks as something you might want to take with you as you desperately try to get people to show up at meetings, rallies, marches, gatherings, city council events uh, to pursue what they want to pursue. It's not like they disagree with you and you call them up on the phone uh, or, you, or you email them. Uh, you're emailing people who agree with you to show up. Half of democracy is showing up. And it's amazingly difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Just to get people to break their routine and lock arms with you on pursuits of justice that they already agree with you on. Half of democracy is showing up. And it's amazingly difficult, isn't it? Yeah. Just to get people to break their routine and lock arms with you on pursuits of justice that they already agree with you on. Okay, so that's a real problem. That's why I always carry my favorite denomination. This is a $2 bill. You should hand out $2 bills. Because on the back are the, the white males who gathered to write the Declaration of Independence and announce it on July 4th, 1776. Whatever you say about them, you know, some of them had slaves and all, they thought they were signing their death warrant when they took on King George III and the most powerful army in the world. Uh, so it was quite an act of courage for them. And what you want to say to people is, aren't you glad they showed up? Huh? Well, why don't you show up? Because that is the signal most important problem we have in this country, the lack of civic motivation. I'm not talking about a lot of it. I'm talking about the lack of sufficient civic motivation. That is, 1% or less of the people reflecting what Abraham Lincoln called the public sentiment, that is, majority public opinion, can turn around most of the bad trends that you see in this country. They can turn the government around, they can turn big business around. And that's not the way we grow up. We do not grow up learning how to build civic power and affect the political system and economic system. It's the reverse. We grow up in essentially trade schools all the way through graduate school. They're very vocational. They don't really teach civic power, civic experience with, between the schools and the community. They don't teach about civic tools. They don't teach about the victories of civic history throughout the country and the advance of justice. Uh, they teach them how to look at computer screens. They teach them how to maneuver computers. They basically are teaching them to be cogs in giant corporate or bureaucratic wheels. And I said, well, Set aside the children under 18, and you take 1% of Weehawken, New Jersey, and it would be 100 people. What if there were 100 people like you? What would you be able to accomplish? I thought he was going to collapse with delirium. <laughs> like, 100 people? Why would we do everything? Because it reflects majority sentiment, which is camouflaged as cynicism withdrawal among the rest of the citizens. Now, to the challenge of the 1%, just look at history. Take some of the biggest mass movements in our country that prevailed, okay? They became mass movements. The anti-slavery movement. Apart from the Civil War, when the Liberty Party started uh, on the <coughs> slavery agenda in 1840, it was a tiny party. 
Aren't we glad, by the way, that the people who voted for the Liberty Party didn't have today's mindset of least worse between the two major parties? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, at the peak, there was far less than 1% of people who were modestly engaged in anti-slavery efforts. What is modestly engaged? Let's say 100 hours a year in the abolition movement. 100 hours a year. The women's suffrage movement, which started formally in about 1846 in Seneca Falls here in upstate New York with six women in a farmhouse, at its peak in 1919 when the amendment came through, far less than 1%. Yeah, there were marches, there were demonstrations. Women would go house to house in places like Kansas, knock on the door, and the men would throw dirty water from the second floor of the house and laugh at them. They were arrested in front of the White House for protesting uh, in the early 20th century. But it was far less than 1%. And let's define the 1% level of energy. Let's say it's equivalent to a modest bird watching habit <laughs> or being part of a plain bridge or a bowling league. Okay, so you see someone who really likes bowling. It's about 200 hours a year, I would say. 200 hours a year. Uh, so you take any, any hobby that people are serious about, not to mention television habits, okay, like people who watch soap operas, I wouldn't want to count those hours. Uh, so let's say two to 300 hours a year. Okay. You know, cynics think they're smart, especially in the Ivy League. Oh, see these cynics. It's like a it's like a masquerade for profundity. <laughs> They're all crooks. The big boys are going to always get their way. Fine. That's called exiting from democracy and undermining your children and grandchildren's prospects. Cynics withdraw. Skeptics resurge. So everything starts with a conversation. Two people. Every major movement starts with a few people. The populist progressive movement started in 1886 in East Texas. In six months, signed up 200,000 farmers with dues of $1. That's $50 today. Just think of that. Going from farmhouse to farmhouse, ranch to ranch, a handful of farmers who were outraged at the railroad rates that were imposed on them to take their crops to market, and the interest rates that the banks hit them with to give them loans, signed up 200,000 farmers in six months, $1 dues. They had no phone, they had no electricity, they had no motor vehicles, they had muddy or sandy roads, they didn't use the telegraph, and they definitely didn't have email. And then they galvanized the greatest progressive populist movement, reform movement in our history. They elected senators, representatives, governors, almost the president. They went from about 1886 to about 1913. What's your reaction to that? You want to know mine? Shame on you. We have electricity, we have telephone, we have internet, we have all of that. Maybe shame doesn't work with you. Certainly doesn't work with the young generation. That's what I'm told. No, oh, never use shame. Well, you'd want to use guilt. That's worse. Freud is worse. But young, shame, give me another motivation. Your children, your grandchildren, posterity. That's what it is. Now, it is important to recognize that we have a huge left-right alliance potential here. All ruling classes divide and rule. So they divide left-right, blue state, red state on things that they're really divided on. You know, reproductive rights, school prayer, something called over-regulation. But isn't it interesting? that there are at least 24 areas, I put it in this book, 
24 areas of convergence that there is public opinion backed by left, right. In some areas, they're going operational. That is, they're beginning to affect what candidates do. And in some areas, in, in our past, they've broken through and got laws enacted. For example, the Freedom of Information Act of 1974 that we worked on, the companies fought that bitterly because they didn't want us to find out things that they were working inside closed doors with the government, like the Food and Drug Administration and so on, Defense, Defense, Defense Department. They lost because conservatives and liberals, they want open government. The auto safety bill that was in Congress passed unanimously in the House of Representatives, bitterly opposed by the auto companies and the auto dealers. They lost because there's no such thing as a Republican seatbelt or a Democratic airbag. People want to protect their families. Left, right, didn't matter. When you get away from the abstract generalities and ideologies, you go down to where people live, work, raise their family, empirical reality kicks in. How about this one? Try a left-right poll on the Patriot Act. You say to conservatives and liberals, uh, do you want your government to search your home and not tell you for 72 hours? Or to look into your medical and financial and other personal files and details uh, without probable cause? And uh, to arrest you under totally flimsy pretexts that the Patriot Act enables you to be arrested with? That's why Ron Paul is against the Patriot Act. That's why people in the progressive area are against the Patriot Act. Left, right, alliance, juvenile justice, 15 legislators or legislatures have already passed because liberal and conservative lawmakers think it's crazy to put these kids behind bars for 20, 30 years to be caught with a little bit of marijuana or cocaine. And now that's spreading into dealing with the minimal sentence racket and filling the jails with nonviolent offenders. Half of the people in jail, and you know we have the highest number of people in jail per capita of any country in the world by far. They're in for drug raps or nonviolent uh, offenses. So you've got Newt Gingrich uh, with liberals and conservatives uh, going for prison reform. The right wing has another reason, because it costs the taxpayer too much to keep these people in jail for smoking a joint or whatever. Uh, but they're beginning to learn from the liberals that there are human rights aspects to it as well. We have to get over the yuck factor. I have trouble with my liberal progressive friends when I say, look, you've got to team up with Grover Norquist, because he hates corporate welfare. He calls it crony capitalism. Half of Washington is corporate welfare. Handouts, giveaways, you know, subsidies, Wall Street bailouts, loan guarantees, on and on. That's what, that's what modern corporate capitalism is. It's government guaranteed capitalism. It's not your local family owned grocery store where they can sink or swim depending on how they deal with their customers. No, corporate capitalism rarely goes bankrupt. If, it, if it's heading for it, they go to Washington and you bail them out. So corporate capitalism, that's the phrase we ought to use. Corporate capitalism. I mean, my father was a capitalist. He ran a restaurant, bakery, and delicatessen. The small capitalists, they don't have that much power. They have to meet you every day, look you in the eye, and there's reasonable competition until Walmart comes in. Uh, corporate capitalism is on the side. Corporate capitalism combines the worst of commercial incentives with enormous power over government, over technology, over labor, and over capital. There's not much left, and a good deal over consumers. Corporate capitalism is so self-driven that if an individual behaved that way, the individual would be committed to a mental health institution. It's another way of saying we've got to start talking about institutional insanity. Like when GM obstructs 
for six years being toilet trained and keep filling your lungs with nitrogen oxides and carbon monoxide. If an individual did that to make a few bucks, what would that individual have viewed as? And now the drug companies are basically saying, well, we charge you $4.70 for a pill, but it's going up to $47 because we have a monopoly patent. And if you can't pay, you die. Too bad. That's a corporate crime in any sane society. And it's headlines now every day. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the nature of the corp modern global corporation? Why have we given it the authority to control us in a thousand ways when its very existence comes from being chartered by government? Financiers do not create corporations. Only the state of New York, Delaware, California, bring corporations into existence, give them limited liability and other privileges, then the financiers put the money in. So what we give them by way of charter, that's their birth certificate, we can condition. We can withdraw the charter, as some attorney generals did in 1890 to Standard Oil of Ohio, for example, it was misbehaving, they pulled the charter. Standard Oil had to go to New Jersey. It's had a more enabling climate. But it got a message. We've forgotten that history completely. We don't even think that we can use the charter, the birth certificate, the, the constitution of the corporation, as a regulatory device. We can throw these corporations into bankruptcy and put new trustees in uh, that put the corporation on the legal, humane, and and behave, behaving pathway. Now corporations often go into bankruptcy if they can't pay their creditors. But what if they poison the environment? We should have a system of environmentally imposed bankruptcy where the board of directors are removed, the offices are removed, and trustworthy public servants or leading citizens are put in place in order to reduce the silent violence inflicted on innocent people by what we too charitably call pollution. So we have to think differently about corporations. And the first thought is they have an uninhibited drive to control everything. That challenges them. And they are more daring than ever before because they're global. They can pit one government against another. Oh, you don't like the labor union in Detroit? We'll go to China. We'll go to Mexico. Yeah, we'll lay you all off. Hollow communities. So you see how they have controlled every segment of challenge. They don't win them all. Fortunately, there are people like us who stop them now and then. But they have severely worked, weakened labor unions in part because of anti-labor union laws, like the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947, which is the most anti-labor union law in the entire Western world, and the Democrats somehow, even when they controlled the White House and Congress, never got around to repealing it. They control labor unions through these trade agreements that allow companies to ship whole jobs and industries to fascist and communist regimes abroad who keep workers in their place 65 cents an hour, and then ship back into our country with reduced tariffs and quotas. Fish coming from China, very often contaminated. Cars coming from Mexico. Um, not building their domestic markets, relying on export markets. And the companies get away with that. They deal with us as consumers. When was the last time you didn't sign a fine print contract? We're supposed to have freedom of contract. See how we grow up corporate? Do you ever think of changing the terms of fine print contract? Let's say you go into an auto dealership and you say, I want this car. The, the salesman said, terrific, okay. How much is it, your used car? We'll give you so much for your used car. Let's check your credit. Throws all kinds of fine print for you to sign on the dotted line. Do you ever think, never mind that you have done it. And this is an alert 
audience, right? Do you ever think of saying, hold on, just a minute. <laughs> Cross out the paragraph with the warranty and double it. Sign. Right? You start amending the contract. So what are you doing? And so, you know, I grew up being told uh, we live in a country where there's freedom of contract. So I'm just giving you my version. I hope you sign it. <laughs> Growing up corporate is. Do you know what happens when we are contract peons for home mortgages, for installment loans, for all kinds of health insurance, for hospital agreements, and so on? We lose all bargaining power. They can tell us you, you cannot go to court under your constitutional right because you agree on, on page 18 in tiny print to go to compulsory arbitration. And you agree that we could change this contract at any time without your consent. And there are some companies that charge you when you quit them. They'll charge you an exit fee because they control your credit card. They can control your credit score. You see how they do it? Gradually it gets tighter. The noose gets tighter and tighter. Governments, that's an easy one. 1,500 corporations get their way with the majority of members of Congress these days. Where are we? There's only 535 of them up there on Capitol Hill. We're minions back home. Do you know 10 people in your congressional district whose principal hobby is riding herd on your member of Congress? Why not? Because we grow up feeling, believing, experiencing powerlessness. It's easy to turn it around. Nobody can stop you from going to rallies and marches. That's what you got to say to your people who are saying they're too busy. They don't want to show up. It's very important to see how they control parents by direct marketing their children. And you, you experience that every day. Just think of the channels of persuasion and marketing that go straight to children these days. And that's pretty radical. There are no conservative families who like that. They lose control of their children to all horrible <coughs> products and violent programming. Here's a quick list. Require that the Department of Defense budget be audited annually. Do you know that the Defense budget, Department budget is unauditable? How about that? The biggest budget in the history of the United States, anywhere from seven, eight hundred billion. They can't give the Government Accounting Office of the Congress data every year to be audited. No wonder they lost $9 billion in the first five months in Iraq. Where is it? $9 billion? We don't know where it is. You know, a couple billion here, a couple billion there. That's up to real money after a while. <laughs> Immediately fund 100 full-time lobbyists to go up on Capitol every day. They get to know everything, staff, vulnerabilities, connect with the grassroots get the procurement arm of the government to, to uh, put bids out for <coughs> sustainable products instead of polluting products, uh, and so on. I'm not interested. See, it isn't just the opponents. It's when you, people on your side don't put their resources where their mouth is or have a totally zany concept of giving up on Congress. When you have Al Gore say, the Koch brothers are so powerful in Congress. Here's a former senator and representative. Why should you be so defeatist? Why should you be so defeatist? Give me 1% in the congressional district on these issues. It's like that. Because it represents majority opinion. I mean, the right wing really wants solar energy. No kidding, I wonder why. It's obvious. They want solar energy because it's decentralized. It, the strings aren't pulled by forces all over the world. It's under their control, more and more, uh, and uh, it's good for their kids. Spend $100 billion or $200 billion on energy infrastructure for a bunch of oil companies. You know, where's our solar plant, right? Where's our wind plant? Where's our fixing the, you know, exploding Boston and, Man and you know, Manhattan infrastructure? Right. The problem is renewable energy is democratic technology, and fossil fuels, nuclear, are corporate technology. They can control us with fossil fuels. Who can dig a coal mine, right? They can control us with fossil fuels, nuclear, it's highly centralized, etc. But energy efficiency in solar is decentralized. That's why they've been blocking it for decades. You know, the, so it isn't a technological issue; it's a control issue. 
how they can control us. They can't control us with decentralized soul, although they're trying to combine these groups and merge, etc. But they're not going to win that fight. There's too much spin-off, too much innovation now in solar. It's breaking out all. They lose control of their children to all horrible <coughs> products and violent programming. Just let me uh, conclude with the, uh, a quick list of what I think is a left-right alliance. And by the way, when there is a left-right alliance, it's, it's unstoppable. You want to scare a senator or representative, walk into their district office, six lefties and six righties, <laughs> and say, we are here together, woo! Because <laughs> you know, they know how to game one, one or the other, depending on the Republican Democrat. They know how to game. Especially if you come in with multiple issues. One way to lose your influence over a candidate for public office is to just be a single issue candidate. Because they know how to game the single issue. They'll either say, yeah, I'm all for you, or I'm sorry, I'm not. But if you give them like 10 issues, you, you overcome them with cognitive dissonance. They don't want to deal with you. Yeah, there are ways to become smart voters. Unfortunately, we don't learn it in high school. So. We won the Whistleblowing Protection Act in 2013. The corporations delayed it for two years. When it won, it was overwhelming. We won the False Claims Act, allowing uh, people to sue the government for fraud on the government, especially federal employees like fraud on the Pentagon, fraud on Medicare. In 1986, that was bitterly opposed by, obviously, the corporate contracting world. But it was proposed by Republican Senator Grassley from Iowa and Democrat Howard Berman in California. And it was unstoppable. Uh, the pending invasion of Syria three years ago, they came in on the Congress emails, letters, phone calls, left, right, <coughs> stop Congress cold from another venture. So here, here are the. Uh, but that's what it is. And, and what allowed that to happen is we didn't know enough about these alternatives and we weren't organized to push them forward. I also think that it's important to not, I don't call them alternatives. Because I feel like that d diminishes their stats. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? It's like renewables and natural energy is really important because that's like the enlightened path. Yeah. The you know, efficient path. The path that doesn't do dumb stuff path. <laughs> and so I think that like, it's really important, like you know, like Ralph is saying, and Bandana is also saying, is like just make, make sure you claim the territory. You know, don't let them pretend that they have the knowledge. You know, because they don't, and don't let them marginalize us. And, and you know, like every every meeting y'all go to, you know, you know, you know, face them down with the with the enlightened knowledge. You have to just hand them a few a few equivalent dollars. And then they got them, and they got their water, contaminated the water. And then when they deplete it, bye-bye, and there's a wreckage, like strip mining. So it's got to be done fast. And you think this presidential election is going to push it? Oh, I mean, maybe Bernie wins the primary. Uh, but we got to make it happen. It's amazing how undemanding we are. Yeah, that's right. Very, if you have low expectation levels of politicians, They'll oblige you. You've got to introduce the students to their community, to the problems, the solutions, the natural assets, the whole thing. Because the educational system is overwhelmingly vocational or learning myths. By rote. <laughs> if, you can't do it in, if you can't do it as parents and community leaders in the schools, you do it after the school. And You'll get a significant number of students that way, and there's plenty of space. And uh, a lot of parents would like that because they're both working. And you start it, you know, in the middle school level. And they're just simple things that the students are totally factually unprepared uh, to understand. For example, the, co the biggest wealth in our country, the commons. It's the air. It's the water. It's the public lands. It's the trillions of dollars of research and development that built the semiconductor industry, the biotech industry, the containerization industry, the, the aerospace industry, our money. Okay, so 
They don't even grow up studying it. I, I went to law school, we never, met, we never studied it. The commons uh, where everybody owns a piece of it. Okay, so if we own the biggest wealth in the country, like the public lands, you want to start with that and offshore, why don't we control it? Why do we let corporations control the timber companies, oil companies, the broadcast industry? Why do they do that? Because the, the youngsters do not grow up learning possession of the commons. You want to have fun with young people and just say, give me a list of everything you own, and I'm going to give you 15 minutes. And then they read it back to you. Well, I own, you know, a music set, I own bicycle, I own clothes, I own books, I own savings account. I own a rug, whatever. And you keep going, you're down to paper clips, right? And you say, you're missing something. You own, you own part of America. You own the public airways. It's just simple. And that's what you can learn after school. You learn a menu of understanding power. Because if, if you're educated and you don't understand power, you're not being educated. Because politics, Democracy is all about who has power, who doesn't, and who should. This is called globalization has basically taken power totally out of the local, out of the regional, and even out of the national system. And uh, WTO did it, and now TPP, TTIP, all the bilateral agreements are basically about taking power away. But it also affects taking power away from community, because I see it as three sectors. All the debate is around the two sectors, the state, the government, versus the corporation. But the reality is the really big sector is society itself and community. And the commons is where community governs. So the encroachment of corporations has been the enclosures of the commons. You know, so it's been a lateral appropriation and then a vertical appropriation of power and ownership and everything else. Uh, our job is twofold. We want to bring power down and back where it belongs and to know where it belongs, which is the issue of subsidiarity. Maud and I are part of the IFG and we wrote a whole book on the alternatives to globalization in which there's a very long chapter on subsidiarity, which is decision should be made at the lowest level, which is appropriate. So defense is national, but growing food should be local. It shouldn't be part of global free trade agreements. Taking care of your watershed should be local, shouldn't be part of free trade agreements. But the other is this horizontal recovery of the commons. And I've been engaged in my country of shaping new laws, where we do shape laws, and they're implemented at a national level, but they're about recognition of the highest authority at the local level. And that's something that's usually not seen. That even to reclaim local power, recognition at a national level or at a global level uh, is a vital step. So there are two laws that are protecting our indigenous people right now. The first is a law in 1996, we wrote it, literally one year after WTO. And it's called the Law for Tribal Self-Rule. I mean, it has an Indian title of Panchayati Raj Extension for Chidu areas. But basically a lot of tribal self-rule. And that is what kept the tribes empowered to fight the coal companies, the mining companies. And of course they've come back with brutal force and these zones are now militarized. The second law was a forest rights law, basically saying the, the British and the imperial powers treated the forests as theirs, but these belong to the people. And, and the ancient communities have the first rights to decide what will happen to the forest. And on the basis of this law, two of the biggest projects of global investment have been shut down. One is called Niamgiri, which is a bauxite mining by one of the biggest mining giants now. Um, Niamgiri means the mountain which upholds the sacred law. And one of the most ancient tribes, which has deliberately stayed as a forest culture. And they use this law. I mean, they use resistance and non-cooperation, but they also they use the law. And the biggest ever steel plant was planned on the eastern coast of India. It's called Fosco. And it was called Korean, but the Koreans lost it with uh, the globalization and corporate takeover. Wall Street and Buffett 
own most of the shares, that same forest rights law <coughs> was used, and I think just about three months ago, they were true. So, uh, you know, I think we have to be more subtle, we have to be pro more uh, simple about the profile. But I have friends who think, oh, it was a, a law at the national level, and it's assumed that it's about national power. No, it's recognition at national level about local power. My great, 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 greats lived over there too, right? So, you know, like I feel like, you know, that's a good thing and I want to keep that. And so I'm grateful. You know, I'm supremely grateful for what the creator gave us and, and gave us, you know, and uh, my, I, I try to just, uh, it, it doesn't take much to be grateful to do that. And, to, and that life that we have is reaffirmed through living it, you know? Uh, and harvesting wild rice is a lot of physical labor. You know, those of you who know, you know, I don't need a shrink because I have a wood pile. So, that is how you, like, I work out my issues with Enbridge often on the wood pile if I cannot work it out in the hearing process. And, uh, you know, so that, that, is, that, is, that is how I do things. And my, my father used to say, um, he passed away many years ago, but he used to tell me, Winona, I don't want to hear your philosophy if you can't grow corn. <laughs> and so that was the other thing I do, and this year was my best corn crop ever. <laughs> right from the get-go, I couldn't stand bullies. Right when I was four years old, five years old, or when I was older, I'd see a fifth grader beating up a third grader. And I just had a visceral reaction at the intervening. Sometimes at my price, I paid the price. But when, when I became an adult, I found a plethora of bullies. <laughs> you know, official groups out of control. And, and then I realized I couldn't do it all, obviously, by myself after the whole GM issue and getting auto companies regulated. And so I became completely focused on multiplying my efforts, starting the public interest research groups, starting groups on educational testing, starting groups in California, in Florida, and we could have started hundreds of them if it wasn't for a certain Supreme Court decision that blocked us. Push community self-reliance. There are two major ways to deal with giant corporations, other than suing them and regulating them. One is to displace them with local businesses, co-ops, farmer to consumer market, renewable energy, local renewable energy, community health clinics, community banks, credit unions, you know it all. Every dollar we spent with these local businesses is one dollar less spent for the Bank of America or Exxon Mobil or end corporate personhood. People now understand Hey, how can corporations be humans like us? Uh, simple. Once they are considered humans, once they are considered persons, they have all the constitutional rights we have. Even though the Constitution never mentions the word corporation, never mentions the word company, never mentions the words political parties, only mentions human beings, why are we ruled by these political parties indentured to corporations? Because we let them. We let them. Corporations are not like you and me. That's what we have to keep thinking. They can create their own parents, can you? Called holding companies for evasive maneuver. They can go bankrupt and pay retention bonuses to the crooks at the top to retain your experience and institutional memory. How would you like to have that one after you went bankrupt? Huh? On and on and on. You cannot have equal justice under the law if there is equality between the corporate entity, artificial person, artificial entity, and real human beings. It's not possible. You cannot have equal justice under the law between you and General Motors because General Motors have all kinds of privileges and immunities under corporate law that they've rammed through with other companies, state and federal legislators that you will never be able to acquire, even if you're a billionaire individual. Okay, the time is up. Let me conclude on this note. 
take this person. <laughs> People like you are very concerned about the future of the world and the country and your community. You wouldn't be here if you weren't. You also have read about why you're concerned. You've thought about it. You've talked about it. Some of you have written about it, spoken about it. Some of you have sued and petitioned, which is good. But if we're going to get to 1% of the people who are part of the serious civic society, and it's the civic arena that has to control the political and corporate arenas, if it doesn't, we're not a democratic society. If we're going to get to that point, we have to move from congregations that are full of people who are concerned and find the meetings interesting, to people who are concerned and find the meetings interesting, and also demonstrate a commitment and action to expand the institutional base of the civic culture. That means full-time groups. Where would we be without the ACLU on civil liberties over 100 years ago? Where would we be on civil rights without the NAACP? Where would we be on environment without a scattering of full-time environmental groups with scientists, engineers, lawyers, organizers, writers, publicists, graphic artists, you name it? All of these groups are smaller than one sizable corporation. And look what they've brought us. That is the lesson of civic history. A huge leverage from a very small number of people, representing 1% of engaged people and a majority more passive public opinion, sprinkled with a few full-time groups where people call themselves environmental advocates, organic food advocates, small farm preservation ad advocates, Native American rights, you know. And why don't we learn that lesson? It's shown to be true again, again, and again. It's liberated beyond what people thought, millions of people, to fulfill life's possibility. Question we have to ask ourselves. What's the next group we want to expand that already exists with full-time advocates representing our part-time support or our larger public opinion. And what new groups have to be started? Because there's nothing there. Zero group, zero group on auditing the Pentagon. Zero group advocating the coming responses to the horrors of artificial intelligence. Two or three little full-time groups on biotech changing the nature of nature, pretty tumultuous and zero group to deal with nanotechnology. The little tiny microscopic drone that will alight on your head and record everything ever after. To take one example. How many of these groups are we going to start? They don't have to be big to begin with. They can be five, six, seven people in terms of national groups, or they can be one or two in terms of local. We have to assess ourselves civic time, civic dues, civic commitment, civic action. And we'll still be concerned and find things interesting. Thank you.